you would never know it to look at Nair Tamid maybe, but today we are a multiplex. So in another part of our building, Beth Orr of Studio City is conducting Torah study. We have such a beautiful group here this morning and so glad to see those of you who can join us on YouTube this morning. Thank you, David, for running our tech. I'm going to turn to the Haftarah. And we don't get to hear this one that often because, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these two parshiot, Behar and Behukotai, are often done together. So we don't usually, or much too often, we don't get this haftarah for Bahar all on its own. It is from the book of Jeremiah. You'll find the introduction on page 758. It's not a long haftarah, but it's a powerful one. And because we have an unusual day, I'm just going to divide up the drash in two pieces. A piece of a drash here. This little bit of Jeremiah speaks directly about Jeremiah providing for a future. Following the Torah mitzvot that are laid out in Bihar for taking proper responsible ownership of the land and providing for its future. But Jeremiah, a tormented prophet of the exile, has, as I think many of us can relate to, a lot of difficulty envisioning the future or feeling positive about it. This is a famous section in Jeremiah's very long prophetic book where he purchases a parcel of land and fills out all of the paperwork and goes through all of the red tape, but all the while he has an unsettled feeling in his tummy that he's on a fool's errand, that his hard work and taking care of business today will lead to nothing in the future. God had told him to buy this parcel of land and do all of the appropriate activities to make sure that it was legally purchased and provided for in his family. But then Jeremiah looks and says, God, you told me to buy this land, but now look. Our land has been taken over. This misfortune has befallen us. The siege mounds have been raised against the city to storm it. And the city, because of sword and famine and pestilence, is at the mercy of the Chaldeans who are attacking it. Why did I buy that parcel of land? And God puts him in his place and says, you don't know the future. Buy that parcel of land. Keep your chin up, Jeremiah. You don't know the future, and you may not live to see it. But do the right things today to at least have the best chance of providing for the future. It is good advice. It is not advice that we are supposed to take and exploit and accumulate and acquire beyond any kind of appropriate or moderate measure, but it is good advice. Plant the garden, tend to it, fertilize it, cultivate it, make it beautiful. There's no guarantee that you'll see tomorrow let alone the next generation, but have planted something beautiful today to have the best chance of a hopeful and redeemed tomorrow. We can relate to Jeremiah's despair, but we can also take that advice and run with it. We have been featuring today, or this week, Rabbi Akiva, a central figure in the legends surrounding Lagba Omer. 
And I'm very grateful to those of you who were able to be with us for our once a month lunch and learn the other day, where we had a bit of a deep dive into the legends and teachings and person of Rabbi Akiva. I brought a few of the materials that we used for our lunch and learn the other day, and I'll leave them outside if anyone will want to share of them. He was an extraordinary personage. He began his studies at the age of 40, and he is considered the patron saint of older learners. It was said that he went to the cheder, to the Hebrew school, with his young son, sat on a small seat, and learned the Aleph Bet, along with all of the other children. Though he started his learning late in life, he rose to become one of the greatest sages our people has ever known. His rulings in the Talmud are revered, and he is a reminder that it is never too late in life to begin an extraordinary new venture. We were thinking of him especially on Lagba Omer because it is said that he amassed a school of 24,000 students and all of them died during this period between Passover and Shavuot, presumably because of ill treatment of one another. Despite this Torah portion's double reminders that we are not to wrong one another, apparently even Rabbi Akiva students did just that. It was also theorized that they were part of a battalion, that Akiva was on top of everything else, a, a high-ranking military person who was leading his students in one of the many rebellions, the ill-fated rebellions against Rome. So it is possible that they died in military battle. But the story comes to us that they were unkind to one another, and thus they brought a plague upon themselves. And one day, on the 33rd day of the counting of the Omer, the plague on Rabbi Akiva's students was lifted, and thus it is a day of celebration. That's one pillar of the story of Lagba Omer. There's a whole other one. We looked at that during the week, and please God, we'll do that again. This little, minor, not even a festival, has so many layers of it, of meaning associated with it. But that was the other day. But Rabbi Akiva is still very much with me uh, as we come into this parsha, There is a phrase, if you still have your Etz Chaim, it's on page 743. And this is Leviticus chapter 25, verse 35. If your kinsman, being in straits, comes under your authority and you hold him as though a resident alien, let him live by your side. And verse 36, do not exact from him advance or accrued interest, but fear your God. Let him live by your side as your kinsman. The Hebrew is vechei achicha imach. And if you look at the bottom of the page, Dr. Lieber of Blessed Memory includes, this verse is the source of the famous ruling by Akiva. If two men in a desert have enough water to keep only one of them alive, the possessor of the water may drink it all, rather than share it and condemn both to die of thirst. Our neighbors are entitled to live alongside us, not instead of us. From the Babylonian Talmud, Bava Metziah, 62a. Now, I happen to have a few copies of that piece of Talmud here, so you don't have to take home your book or memorize it. If I have somebody who's comfortable to maybe pass out a few of them, Mom, can I bother you? Thank you. If you have come as a pair, if you would please just take one. Something for you to take home. And if we had world enough in time, we would open this up to discussion, but the microphones don't translate too well onto YouTube, so I'll let you all off the hook today and just share a couple of ideas about it. So I'll read to you the full piece of Talmud becoming Talmud scholars in our community. It was taught. Two people were traveling, and one of them had a flask of water in his hand. If both of them drink, they would both die. And if one of them drinks, he would reach the nearest settlement. So in other words, there's not enough water 
for them to both drink enough to survive till they get to a settlement. That's the unwinnable proposition that the Torah lays out, the Talmud lays out. Ben Petora expounded, it is better in such a case that both of them drink and die rather than one of them see the death of his fellow. And that was the accepted view for a long time until Rabbi Akiva came and taught Leviticus 25, 36. The life of your brother is with you. This means your life takes precedence over the life of your fellow. It is not an easy scenario. But as time went on, Rabbi Akiva's view came to be the new precedent. It's a thorny case. It requires a lot of thought, a lot of discussion. But he borrows from Leviticus, and because Rabbi Akiva particularly quotes from the Torah, it was always preferred that the oldest source possible be used as evidence. And so here Rabbi Akiva does just that. He goes right to the Torah and he says, Veche achicha imach, the life of your brother is with you, next to you, not in place of you. Rabbi Akiva was known for his humility. In so many instances and legends about his life, he was a man of enormous anava, enormous sense of his place and his space. And in this remarkable teaching, where he overrules the established thinking on such a matter, he makes a very strong statement. It may not be one that you all agree with, but this was the ruling. Akiva building on Hillel's earlier notion of if I am not for myself, who will be for me, looks at this unwinnable situation. One person has a flask, the other doesn't. They don't question why or how the person got the water. But if both people will die, better that one of them should live. Ben Petora understood in his thinking that the trauma of one person surviving while the other person had died would be overwhelming, that his life, the life of the survivor, would be perhaps too impacted to be able to live with whatever repercussions or guilt would have ensued if he had known that he took the water and his friend died in the desert or along the road. And there is a lot of wisdom, perhaps, in that position. The feeling was that they should make a pact together and both give themselves up to God. But Rabbi Akiva, who lived and died under unimaginable circumstances, said no. When resources are utterly scarce, if there is not enough for everyone to survive, the person who is holding the resources, however they got them, and that's, of course, potentially very problematic, but the person holding the water is entitled to save themselves. So as our day continues, I'll ask you maybe at lunch or this afternoon or in the days to come, if you like, to consider some of these very difficult questions that confront us certainly in our time. As we have scarce resources to go around and always have, and they get scarcer and scarcer. When water is rationed in Southern California, when baby formula is beyond precious to find, I cannot imagine the terror of that. When land and housing and medicine and compassion seem to be in such short supply, we might ask ourselves, 
And of course, the answer I imagine is yes to my first question at the bottom of our page, and I will make this available on our website. Have you ever been in a situation or confronted a reality whereby not everyone could benefit equally from the available resources? How do you feel about that? I don't take for granted that everyone feels sad about that. So I really would ask us to examine our souls. A lot of potential for growth. What decisions have you made to be okay with the situation? Have you tried to relieve the difficulty, and if so, how? Which teacher's answer is more in line with your own thinking about the dilemma of scarce resources? Do you have another possible solution? It's a terrifying prospect to think of there only being enough for one person to survive. But the Talmud and Judaism is not afraid to ask such questions. It doesn't pretend to have all of the answers. And even when it does come up with an answer, it doesn't pretend that it's easy or clean or comforting. Resources are scarce. Some resources we can have maybe limitless amounts of. Love and compassion and maybe generosity. But Judaism never said that we should sacrifice ourselves so that others might live. We're allowed to look after ourselves. But we should have deep and abiding compassion and respect and honor for the humanity of our fellow travelers. But we are given permission to take care of ourselves and our own families. It is a dilemma, my friends. But regardless, we are to act with moderation, to walk the shvil hazahov, the golden path, to just take enough for our needs, to not live with gluttony and excess, and say too bad on them. They shouldn't have been born there, or to that family. So that's something I think we can all work on regardless of how righteous we are. We can always be better. God forbid we would ever be in a situation the like of which this parsha is used to adjudicate. But we are supposed to live with our fellow brothers and sisters. We are not supposed to sacrifice ourselves at their expense. And Rabbi Akiva ultimately gave his life for the sanctification of God's name. There was a point at which all he had left was his soul to give. And he did. Flayed alive in one of the Roman arenas. He is a martyr to the Jewish people. And his life and memory should be for a blessing. Let us continue to learn from him, to remember that it's never too late to get started on a new and marvelous adventure. And it is okay to care for ourselves and to be the best people that we can be, not in excess or too often, I hope, at the expense of anyone else. But may his memory and teachings be for a blessing. Shabbat shalom.